Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jocelyn Chang. Welcome to the Loyola University of Chicago Libraries Focus on the Book Program. And I'm joined by. Hello, everyone. My name is Rowan Obach. I'm a communication and events student worker assistant at the University Libraries. And I'm also a junior currently studying environmental policy at Loyola School of Environmental Sustainability. I'm super happy to be here and assist with tonight's program. I'll be especially helping out during the question and answer portion. And we're really happy to have you all here. Um, I'd like to also introduce our Dean of Libraries, Marianne Ryan. Thanks, Rowan. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Loyola University Chicago Libraries Focus on the Book event. I am Marianne Ryan, Dean of Libraries, and I thank you all for joining us. The Focus on the Book was established as an annual event by and for bibliophiles to provide an opportunity to discuss rare books, manuscripts, and other documents, uh, and those who research, collect, and or preserve them. This year's offering is a really exciting one. Our focus will be on the Peripheral Manuscripts Project, an effort to digitize the medieval era collections from 22 Midwest institutions, including Loyola. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Ian Cornelius from Loyola, Chicago, Dr. Liz Hebbard from Indiana University, and Dr. Sarah Noonan from St. Mary's College. Paul will describe their involvement with this project and share discoveries from their work. Programs such as this are among the many ways that the university libraries facilitates the academic pursuits and cultural enrichment of Loyola and its extended community. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our donors and our library friends who provide financial support that allows us to sponsor events, acquire information resources in all formats, support digital initiatives, initiate new services, and well, the list goes on. If you would like to learn more about what we do, how to get involved, and ways to support us, please visit our website, libraries.luc.edu. Before I introduce members of our panel, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our university archivist and curator of rare books, Kathy Young, and assistant archivist, Ashley Howdeshell, for suggesting tonight's program. And they both are here this evening. I'd also like to thank our library staff for their assistance, organizing, promoting, and facilitating this event, especially Jocelyn Cheng, our community relations and communications coordinator, and Rowan Obach, Jocelyn's right hand. It is now my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Ian Cornelius is an associate professor of English at Loyola University, Chicago. He is the author of Reconstructing Alliterative Verse, The Pursuit meter and of essays on language form and textual transmission of medieval English literature. His current projects include two collaborations, a digital edition of the text of Piers Plowman and the Peripheral Manuscripts Project, which you'll be hearing about shortly. Liz Hebbard is an assistant professor of French and Francophone studies in the Department of French and Italian at Indiana University Bloomington and founding co-director with Patty Ingham of the UI Book Lab. She specializes in literature from medieval France, particularly lyric poetry and music and medieval manuscripts. And she is currently finishing a book on the manuscript tradition of troubadour song. She is currently acting as the primary principal investigator of the Peripheral Manuscripts Project. Sarah Noonan is an associate professor at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana, where she specializes in medieval English literature and manuscript studies and has published work on medieval reading practices, early devotional literature, book history, and pedagogy. Her research has been supported by fellowships from the Folgers Shakespeare Library, the Beinecke Library, and the Huntington Library. She is the founding principal investigator and co-PI of, of the Peripheral Manuscripts Project. And with that, Ian Cornelius will now begin tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. In fact, you all hear from uh, Liz first, and I we will uh, sort of cycle through and each taking a part in this uh, this presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Ryan and Rowan and Jocelyn, for your kind introductions and for inviting us here to speak about our project. 
Um, as Ian said, I'm going to start us off. My name is Liz Hebbard, and I am the primary principal investigator of the Peripheral Manuscripts Project. Our project is a three-year project founded by the Council on Library and Information Resources. Our scope is pre-1600 manuscripts written in Roman alphabet scripts. Um, and I want to emphasize that <laughs> because in the course of uh, exploring these lesser known collections in the region, our partners have identified a lot of materials in other scripts like Hebrew, Arabic, uh, Arabic, Ethiopic. We are making note of those to bring them to the attention of specialists uh, in those materials. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about, you have some basic stats of the project on the screen in front of you. We have 22 partners in the region who are each represented by one of the circles on the map. And their holdings include 75 codices, 518 fragments, 85 documents, and two rolls. Um, and I thought I would just gloss those words quickly, uh, although Sarah will say a little bit more about these numbers in a minute. So um, a codex is a manuscript that is in a book format. And I probably should start with the word manuscript, which is uh, any handwritten document. Um, but as we said, we're interested in handwritten documents from before 1600. So a codex in the book format, codices is, is the, the plural of that word. A fragment or a leaf is material excised from a book. Um, and we use the word leaf. Um, if you think of a page, a page has only one side. So if you think page one on the back of it is page two, we use the term leaf uh, to refer to that whole uh, sheet. So um, most of the fragments that we're dealing with used to be in books. Uh, some of them are still in other books. And then the difference between a fragment and a document is that a document is uh, usually some sort of official record like a, a contract or a deed or an edict. And those were only ever meant to be a single sheet of parchment. They were, they were not usually bound together with other items. Um, and then a roll, some people use the word scroll. Uh, we don't feel strongly about them, um, but obviously sheets of parchment sometimes attached together and then stored, rolled up tightly. Um, so that's an enormous amount of material that we're dealing with at a large number of partner institutions. And I know you don't have time to read this list in detail. We have 22 partners throughout the Midwest, including Indiana University, which is hosting the project um, and undertaking the digitiz digitization of these materials. These partners are mostly smaller institutions that don't have the digital infrastructure to photograph their manuscripts or necessarily specialists in medieval materials on their library staff. Uh, most of these collections are unknown. And when I say unknown, that could mean a couple of things. Either the holdings haven't been reported to a census, any of the major censuses of pre-1600 manuscripts in the US. Uh, Ian will talk about that in a little bit. Or they're simply mysterious items. So they've been known to be in these collections but haven't yet been studied. And I want to pause here because I think we have a tendency to believe that because manuscripts have been around for hundreds of years, we must already know everything there is to know about them. Um, and excitingly, it's not true. Uh, there's so much work still to be done, even on well-described items. So we are particularly interested in learning more about manuscripts in the Midwest. Um, something interesting is that uh, we want to build community among our partners and their holdings. So there are a lot of interesting connections we're already making about uh, collections that have bought from the same book dealers. Uh, that's something I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and we want to put that information, the descriptions that we make and the images that we take back into the hands of our partners for their own teaching, research, outreach, and even uh, acquisition goals. Our team is large. It includes the three of us um, and our other main PI is Michelle Dalmau, my, my colleague here at Indiana, head of digital collection services and one of the directors of the Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities. We have a whole digitization team uh, and you can see their names and titles on the screen. 
And we've also been really lucky to work with a number of graduate assistants um, according to their schedules and our funding. One of our project's strengths is uh, its thorough collaboration. We rely on our partners' vast institutional and collection expertise to help us learn as much about item provenance as possible and uh, to do some of the preliminary inventory work on the items identified for inclusion, as well as uh, in most cases, actually bringing the items here to Bloomington to be digitized. The digitization team cares for items during their stay in Bloomington. Uh, they approach the imaging of each item according to its specific condition and unique features. They ensure a high standard of image capture that is also um, uh, controlled. And they help us envision and create the open access, user-friendly and searchable digital collection that is our end goal for all of this material. Um, and then finally, our team that's here tonight to speak to you, Ian and Sarah and I, our job is uh, to use our expertise in different aspects of manuscript studies to provide as thorough a description as possible of each of these items through observation and research. Uh, so we're all working together to bring a lot of new knowledge about these items to our partners and uh, to scholars across the US. Although we've had to pivot a few times, as you might imagine, because of limitations uh, caused by the pandemic, we are making incredible progress. Um, our project officially began in June of 2020. We hosted a partner meeting that summer over Zoom when we were all figuring out what Zoom was and what it could do. Um, and we oriented uh, partners to the work of the project. And that fall, according to uh, individual partners' abilities, we started our site visits. We visited each of our partner collections. And uh, Sarah's going to talk a little bit about that process in a moment. And then this summer, uh, in June, about a year later, we were able to bring our first items to IU for digitization. And actually, this slide I, I should have updated because of as, as of this week, we have actually returned the first collection of digitized items back to a partner. Um, and then we are ready for an internal launch just for the team of a digital a version of our digital repository in the spring with these first items. We're all so excited to see what we, what we get to play with, um, how we get to display these items and make them accessible and searchable to the public. Uh, so now Sarah's gonna talk a little bit about the site visits and about the digitization process. Thank you, Liz. So as Liz mentioned, we're currently wrapping up our site visits for our project and we've completed 21 out of 22 of those visits. Um, and these visits have really proven crucial to the development of the project since during them, Partners have shared histories of their collections with us. They provided us with historic metadata associated with their items. And we've collaborated to identify potential new items for inclusion in the project. So through our work with our partners, we've identified an additional 13 codices, 140 fragments, 76 documents, one roll, and 10 binding fragments that meet the parameters of our project but we're not reported in our initial kind of grant work. This is a substantial amount of new material. So the visits have enabled us to develop these relationships with our partners that are yielding already kind of wonderful fruit. And uh, we look forward to working with them and, and fostering those relationships over the coming years. Slide. So once a site visit's been conducted, the partners are placed on a schedule to have their items digitized all digitization is being done at IU Bloomington um, in this digitization lab. And our two digitization experts, Kara Alexander and Caitlin Hastings, are, are the ones who are managing and overseeing this process. Once the digitization of a collection is complete, multiple rounds of quality control checks are conducted before the final images are archived and shared with our partners who can use those images freely at their home institutions. And it's worth noting that all images produced by the project will be dedicated to the public domain and freely accessible for future audiences. Um, at this point, then, the PIs turn their attention to researching the digitized manuscripts and drafting item level metadata. And I will turn it over to Ian. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah's just, just uh, mentioned Metadata, a word that I imagine brings joy to the hearts of librarians in the room. Uh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of words about that, um, uh, maybe especially for any students in attendance. Uh, by metadata, we mean information about information. And in library context, descriptive metadata supports discovery and identification. It helps us answer the questions, which X is Y and what is X? Uh, so which books are by Shakespeare? Or uh, when a book is in front of you, what is it? Uh, descriptive metadata is what uh, should direct us to answers of those questions. And examples of meta metadata fields are author, title, date, publisher, keywords, these standard fields that we use every day when we are uh, con conducting research, learning things in the library. Those metadata fields are developed for, and they really apply best to printed books. Medieval manuscripts are, have, are put together in way, importantly different ways being handwritten uh, and require special conventions of description. Some of you here may have uh, encountered the Text Encoding Initiative, TEI, which has a manuscript description module. And that provides useful guidance for markup of descriptions, but it's not a program for organizing metadata creation, which is what Sarah, Liz, and I found that we needed as we began our descriptive work. Slide, please. This uh, here you see just a list of the descriptive metadata fields that we set out to provide for the objects in our, our project. Next slide. And the software that we use to organize this work it goes by the acronym OCHR, the Online Cultural and Historical Research Environment. This is a database system that was is developed at the University of Chicago, initially to support uh, fieldwork in archaeology. And one of the interesting uh, areas of learning for, for us in this project is to see uh, the ways in which archaeological fieldwork and book history overlap in their uh, data needs. Next slide. Here is just a snapshot of ochre in action. Uh, where I have uh, run a, a query to return the, uh, all of the Loyola books currently entered into our database. Next slide. But in showing you that query and it, the query result in Ochre in our database software, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Because if we want to view medieval manuscripts, if we want to study them, research them, uh, we, need to, we need to find them and we need to know where to look. Slide. An important finding aid for those of us in North America is the Directory of Collections in, in the United States and Canada with pre-1600 manuscript holdings. This finding aid was compiled by Melissa Conway and Lisa Fagan Davis and published in 2015. Conway and Davis report nearly 63,000 medieval manuscript items in North America. And they uh, report those items as held in 499 individual collections and repositories. 499 collections and repositories, and yet there's no entry for Loyola University Chicago. Instead, there's this interesting, this intriguing entry which I project here in the slide for St. Ignatius College, reporting three, uh, three codices, three manuscript books, and stating that the current location of those manuscripts is unknown. Well, uh, the census that's reported, that's referenced here, is the census of medieval and Renaissance manuscripts in the United States and Canada, compiled by Seymour Derici and published in 1935. Where have the three manuscript books gone? Our audience today can probably put the pieces of the puzzle together. St. Ignatius College is the name under which Loyal University was founded in 1870 as an ins institution that offered both high school and college education. The high school and college divisions were separated in 1908 and the college division was renamed Loyal University at that time. One might guess that the medieval manuscripts of the college 
would probably go to the university, not the high school. And that's indeed what happened, at least eventually. To make the demonstration though, we need to see the medieval manuscripts held by loyalist libraries, which means again, finding them. Slide please. With, um, actually we're a little bit ahead. Can you go back one? Yes, there we are. Uh, with patience and some ingenuity, one can find some of the of Loyalist medieval manuscripts in uh, the online catalog. Better still, ask a librarian. That's what I did when I uh, joined the Loyola faculty about five years ago now. And I warmly thank Kathy Young, the uh, university archivist and curator of rare books, and Ashley Howdeschel, the assistant university archivist for, I thank them for their generous and continuous assistance over the past years, especially for identifying and pointing me to materials of interest in their collections and accommodating class visits to view the collections with my students. A trip to archives and special collections has a way of making the past real and expanding a student's sense of what a library is. Recently, Kathy has ensure that any report on Loyola's collections of manuscripts and early printed books goes immediately out of date. She's been adding to the collection with smart targeted purchases that build on existing strengths and will be a delight to teach from in the coming years. Slide. So with the help of, uh, of Kathy and Ashley, I've been able to put together uh, this sort of overview of the manuscript holdings at Loyola. Loyola has two collections of medieval manuscripts. At current count, there are four codices, 25 leaves and one roll in the collection of, of archives and special collections located on the second floor of the Kudahi Memorial Library on Lakeshore campus. There are also at least three codices and further leaves in the collection of the Loyola University Museum of Art in Lewis Towers on the Water Tower campus. In 2019, when the Peripheral Manuscripts Project was taking shape, the university administration announced a restructuring of LUMA, putting in question the terms of access to museum collections and curatorial and interpretive responsibility for them. Accordingly, the Peripheral Manuscripts Project decided to limit our scope to the books and leaves in the care of archives and special collections in Kudahi Library. And these are the items on which I offer a couple of uh, of words of, as a report today. Uh, next slide. The leaves can be divided into three groups. And here I use uh, some of the terminology that, that Liz introduced at the beginning of, of this presentation. But we have uh, three documents, that is uh, uh, items produced as, as single leaves before 1600, and a, um, a will, a papal bull, uh, from the 16th century, a personal letter. There are also four leaves derived from, uh, uh, from books cut up by modern booksellers, a controversial practice known as book breaking, about which you will hear uh, more from Liz shortly. These leaves include two from the most notorious American book breaker of all, Otto Ege. The remaining 18 leaves are binding fragments. They derive from manuscript books that were discharged from library collections in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, and then uh, technical term cannibalized, that is they were reused to stand uh, in further bookmaking, reused to strengthen the bindings of other books. Most of these binding fragments, 16 of the 18, remain within their host volume. They're still doing that work of holding the book together. Uh, the remaining two binding fragments have been extracted from their host volume, but uh, discoloring and wear betrays their former use in the binding of a book. Next slide, please. The extracted binding fragments, this pair of ex extracted binding fragments were the first items that captured my attention in Loyalist collections. Records maintained in archives and special collections show that these leaves were donated to 
Hilton Deline College, probably not long after the founding of the college in 1929. During the 1940s, the leaves were studied by Sister Mary Donald, BVM. Sister Mary made a draft transcription of the text of one of the leaves, and she recognized that the text was from a treatise on astronomy, but she did not identify either text. The internet makes text identification a lot easier than it used to be. The astronomical text is from Ptolemy's Almagest in the Latin translation of Gerard Cremona. Gerard translated the text from Arabic in Toledo sometime in the second half of the 12th century. Next slide, please. The textual transmission of Ptolemy's works is a subject of a current research project based in Munich and Würzburg. Scholars, scholars affiliated with that project were very happy to know of the existence of the Loyola fragment, and they've included it in their records, which you see here. Um, next slide, please. In the interest of time, I skip over the other leaves and turn to the books, to the, the codices. Each of the four codices has a record page in Loyola's online library catalog in each case, the existing record is to some extent misleading. These medieval books are even better than advertised. I'll speak briefly about two of them. First one, the first one which you see here is described in the catalog record as a work on grace, free will and predestination by Bernard of Clairvaux. I, you, what you see is the opening, the first, the first uh, the record of the first page of the book. It's a small volume measuring about 195 by 110 millimeters, written on paper in a humanist cursive with several nice examples of the white vine initials favored by Italian humanist uh, bookmakers in the 15th century. Those with sharp eyes might notice a bit of Greek on this first page. That was my first clue that this text might not be St. Bernard. In fact, this is the opening of Aelius Donatus's commentary on the Eunuchus, a comedy by the Roman playwright Terence. Donatus lived in the mid fourth century, about a thousand years before the scribe who wrote this copy. And he, Donatus, is best known today as the teacher of St. Jerome and as the author of elementary textbooks that supplied a foundation for literary education throughout the Middle Ages. Donatus's commentary on Terence was not at all well known in the Middle Ages. For most of the text, we are now dependent on a pair of manuscripts discovered in the 1430s and, 14, 1430s and 1440s, or rather we're dependent on the subsequent copies made of those manuscripts in 15th century Italy. What I'm saying here is that Loyola's Codex act figures in a standard Renaissance humanist narrative, a narrative of the recovery of lost or forgotten texts. And yet that catalog record is not wholly mistaken. If one turns pages in this book, one soon comes to an opening at which Donatus's commentary breaks off and a new text begins in a different ink and page format. This new text is a theological compilation, indeed on uh, having to do with predestination and free will. It's a compilation that consists of excerpts from Pseudo-Augustine, Anselm, and Thomas Aquinas. So in sum, the catalog record currently announces a single text with a single author. In fact, this little book contains extracts from at least four texts by four different authors, three theological excerpts and a literary commentary. Next slide, please. I turn finally to a large book, 310 leaves measuring about 300 by 205 millimeters, written on paper in the 15th century, probably in Germany. This book was rebound in the 19th century and identified on the spine as a manuscript Bible containing the books of Kings, Psalms, and Ecclesiasticus. On the first page, there is the stamp of St. Ignatius College. 
this volume could well be the Biblia Latina Manuscripta listed in the earliest catalog of the books of the college. The contents printed on the spine are not wrong, but they're incomplete. And what one finds inside is, I think, quite interesting. Next slide, please. The major contents are the four books of Kings, that is one and two Samuel plus one and two Kings in the standard modern division of the text. Then, uh, then the commentary on the Psalms by uh, the German cleric Konrad von Soltau. Then the book of Ecclesiasticus. And then the Aureum Bibliae Repertorium by Antonius Rampigolos. This last item is an index of sermon topics, followed by corresponding outlines and notes to help preachers construct sermons on those topics. What I think is especially interesting is that between and after these main items, there are a few shorter texts, almost all of them sermons. And if I were giving this book a title, I would prefer rather than Bible, 15th century preachers anthology. To understand how these different texts relate to one another, one needs to remember that unlike modern books, medieval books were not necessarily written in one go. Loyola's humanist Donatus plus theological excerpts, which I just spoke about, that book originated as two fascicles or booklets subsequently bound, brought together within a single binding. Likewise, this manuscript Bible or preacher's anthology originated as, as a series of booklets, actually four of them. Each of the booklets is itself made up of gatherings of paper leaves folded in to produce choirs. The choirs are very regular, composed of 12 leaves each. With some patience, one can reconstruct the structure of the book, which is what I report to you on this slide. Notice the way that there are four sequences of choirs, each nucleated by a single long item, and the sermons filling in what were originally blank leaves. This one book is actually four books, or a sort of miniature library. So the Peripheral Manuscripts Project will make these, these books make Loyalist codices and, and fragments available to scholars worldwide, as we've already begun to do in uh, the case of Loyalist fragment of the of Ptolemy's Almagest. And here I turn things over to my colleague, Sarah. Thank you. So as has been alluded to, not all the items included in our eventual digital repository will be codices or fragments of books. After several rounds of discussions, we've opted to include virtually all the items that predate 1600 and are written in Roman scripts that are held by our partnering institutions. Miriam Posner has recently argued that, quote, the question of what gets included and excluded within archives and repositories is deeply political, since if an object is not figured as a part of our object of study, it can never be extracted and represented as data, end quote. Had we opted to pursue a narrower focus, it's not clear when our partners might have had the opportunity to digitize and describe those items, nor is it clear when the information about those items would have been accessible to the broader scholarly community. So we have erred on the side of capacious inclusion. The collection of St. Mary's College includes several items that illustrate the breadth with which we are approaching our project's parameters for the sake of ensuring that an accurate record, at least at this moment, of our partners' pre-1600 holdings exists. Slide. In St. Mary's rare book collection, for example, there's an early print volume, an incunabula, um, a printed volume kind of pre-1500. Um, and it was printed circa 1490, 1491 in Venice by Joanna and Gregorius de Forlivio. Slide. This printed volume includes two medical texts, one by Ibn Zuhar, also known as Ibn Zuhar, and one by Averos. As an aside, I would note that this copy is not listed as a known copy in the Incunabula short title catalog, but since this is an Incunabula and not a manuscript, um, it would not have been considered as relevant to our work, except for what is written at the end of the volume slide. 
Eight quatrains of a late Middle English lyric are written on the verso of the book's final folio that are roughly contemporaneous with the late 15th century printing of this volume. The poem is a chanson d'aventure, a genre that depicts a chance encounter of some kind, often one in which the poet overhears a dialogue uh, between two other characters. The genre originated in France and reached the height of its popularity in England between 1450 and 1500. This is the only known copy of this poem to have survived, um, and it's been included in the digital index of Middle English verse. We've opted to include it in our digital collection as well, so that the material context in which it has survived can be viewed by future researchers. But this poem certainly tests the boundaries of what we might consider it to be a manuscript item. It's not a standalone item, and it brushes against being categorized as marginalia. Slide. St. Mary's College also holds a range of additional manuscript items that demonstrate the diverse documentary forms that we're including in the project. While manuscript scholars often focus on codices and fragments of codices, documents are generally studied within a separate discipline um, of diplomatics. We're bringing both books and documents together, however, in our project, and I wanted to quickly walk you through three of the primary documentary forms that are found in our partner's collection. Slide. So epistles or letters are being included, such as this one, which was written by Cosimo Medici, the Duke of Florence in 1553, that instructs the cities of Florence and Pistoia to allow one Captain Marco to conscript men into the service so that he can fight in the ongoing siege of Vienna. Slide. Our project is also including secular charters that might be held by partner institutions, such as this one, which dates from 1492, that records an exchange of land and goods near Padua. Slide. And finally, our project will include a uh, strikingly substantial number of papal documents, such as this great bulla, which is signed by Pope Innocent IV, circa 1249 and 1250, that grants a privilege to the monastery of Santa Caterina di, um, di Singoli in Marsh, Italy. Though uh, through the inclusion of documents such as these, we anticipate garnering the interest of a broad range of audiences in the collection as a whole. And we look forward to uncovering how the documents held by our partners when examined as a group might provide new perspectives on the medieval past and the people who lived within it. And Liz is going to speak to one way in which we're making these connections. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I thought in my little, uh, addition here at the end, I would try to take a step back and think about our interest in the region in the Midwest. And here I want to focus on a figure that Ian already evoked named Otto Aggie. Uh, Aggie was born in 1888 in Pennsylvania and died in 1951 in Cleveland, Ohio. He had a background in art history, um, a training in this aesthetic approach to books. So he was very interested in books as art objects and in handwriting and typography as beautiful. He would later teach book history at Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Institute of Art, where he also served as dean for many years. Uh, Eggie began collecting manuscripts in 1911 when he purchased um, his very first one, which was a Neapolitan Book of Hours. A, a dozen years later, he would publish a short article on it called uh, The Most Beautiful Manuscript in the World. He began breaking books, though, also in 1911, almost immediately, selling uh, half of that book of hours to a classmate to repay some travel debts that he had incurred. However, the book dealing business that he later built that relied on this practice of book breaking wouldn't really be established until about 1935. Book breaking uh, is, as it sounds, the intentional destruction of a book, especially this happens to rare books containing illuminations, maps, woodcuts, um, particularly by the removal of single leaves containing decorative elements, or even the cutting of decorations out of a leaf that remains in place. This was a common practice among antiquarians pillaging in rare books for their amusement. And I have to share that in my archival work, I've seen everything from Christmas cards with medieval initials glued on the front 
to a leaf torn out of a medieval antiphoner by a paying tourist who was visiting the monastic library where that antiphoner was held. Um, and uh, their notes included a complaint that the leaf that they had stole, that they had ripped out was uh, not as nicely decorated as the one their friend had taken. In fact, book breaking is as old as books themselves, as Ian has mentioned even today, medieval books often feature fragments of other books used as reinforcing material in their bindings. But book breaking also involves this more systematic, less practical work of figures within the American 20th century market in mostly amateur book collecting, such as Otto Egge and Philip Duchenez, who imported and then dismantled medieval manuscripts and sold them piecemeal to small libraries and individual private collectors. I'm fascinated by, why, by what I see as a democratic idealism behind Egge's desire to make medieval manuscripts affordable for a different class of collectors. Eggie's goals were to get these objects into the hands of families, public libraries and museums, colleges and universities, and he had a pedagogic motivation. He put leaves together into portfolios in order to illustrate a large variety of hands, of decoration techniques, or examples uh, of a certain kind of text. And in the center, you can see one of his portfolios of famous Bibles. These famous, uh, these portfolios, I'm sorry, were assembled with a series of leaves from the same item. So in portfolios one and two of 50 original leaves, in the same position in each portfolio, you would find a leaf from the same book. Uh, and I'm showing you some hallmarks of Aggie collections in case you ever have a chance <laughs> to poke around. Um, the portfolios are housed in these red or brown boxes. They don't always have the labels on top. Some other hallmarks are these mattings with the red lines, two on the top and bottom and one along each side, usually with Aggie's own handwritten identification in the bottom margin. Uh, and also these telltale identifying labels in which he's used, as you can see, a font that resembles a Gothic hand, sometimes with red. And here it's quite easy to see that this is one from Otto Eggy since his name is there, but they also appear in this format, simply in black without his name. So Eggy's idealism, uh, which is laudable, was also mixed with shrewd capitalist marketing techniques like offering bulk discounts and selling out of museum gift shops and the undeniably inflated profits he made from the division of one sellable item into many sellable pieces. These are recorded in a great deal of surviving correspondence between Eggy and his clients and in his own intense record keeping. Then there's, of course, <laughs> the ethical problem of destroying rare materials. Eggy does address this and, and sort of dismiss it in a very fun little short article that he wrote in a hobby magazine called Avocations, in which he declares by the title, I am a biblioclast. Part of the fashion, fascination that I and others have with Eggy is undoubtedly this the incongruity of his aesthetic, democratic, and economic goals. He forever changed the face and fate of medieval manuscripts in North America. A few years ago, executive director of the Medieval Academy of America, Lisa Fagan Davis wrote, thanks to the work of scholars like ASG Edwards, Barbara Shaler, Virginia Brown, Peter Kidd, William Stoneman, and Scott Guara, Several thousand leaves from several hundred manuscripts that passed through Eggie's hands can now be identified in at least 115 North American collections in 25 states. In other words, more than 10% of the entire corpus of single leaves in the United States can be traced back to Otto Eggie. And that was before our project. <laughs> we found unknown Eggie leaves in six partner collections so far, including one collection with a dozen leaves and uh, several letters from Eggy to the curator who made the acquisition, those I showed a moment ago. 
from the Muskegon Museum of Art in Muskegon, Michigan. The eggy leaves uh, that are part of our project are, are a small subset of the hundreds of leaves that we will be describing, but an exciting subset that we can contextualize both among our partners' collections and with respect to holdings across the US. They also show how fragmentology is a field of knowledge networks that rely on collaboration, just like our project. As we keep working, we, the Peripheral Manuscripts Project, and we fragmentologists in general, we expect more and more eggy material to come to light through concentrated attention to collections throughout the Midwest and close to Aggie's base of operations in Cleveland, but especially smaller collections and in places where scholars might not first look for manuscripts, like a one room public library or a grandmother's hallway. Any new leaf might have some annotation, some signature, some decoration that can tell us more about the book from which it and other leaves were taken. Using digital platforms, oops, using digital platforms, we can continue to reassemble the books that Eggy and others broke, learning more about each one through reuniting them. And through their individual provenances, we can learn more about Eggy and his and his colleagues' business practices and about the creation of American collections in general, both private and public, small and large. Eggy was, to use his own terms from that Biblioclast article, a great destroyer of books, great in terms of the scale of his operation and great in terms of the monolithic figure he traces in the history of medieval manuscripts in study collections across the United States, and especially in the Midwest, a history that, as our grant project is just beginning to show, still promises many more surprises to come. Thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to your questions. Yes, we welcome everyone to either place their questions on the chat or unmute and we may speak. Thank you so much. Thank you to Ian, Sarah, Liz. And I see that, yes, thank you for sharing your, your email too. So even after this presentation, they can be reached. I see it on the chat, thank you. Would anyone have questions, please feel free to speak or enter in chat. Just a, another word about that um, 13th century missile uh, from Uve that that Liz showed to us. I, um, uh, there's a, of course a lot more to say about about that that book, uh, and it's one of these books that has been taken as a a um, uh, case study in the reassembly of books broken up by Otto Egge. Uh and uh, uh, since we're well, I'm I'm here in in uh, uh, Crown Center, looking across that at out my window at um, Kudahi Library as we speak. Since we're here, um, I had to point out that that um, uh, Loyalist libraries have a, a leaf from from that uh, the Bouvet missile that um, uh, uh, figures in in the reconstruction that that Liz uh, pointed us to. I also want to say I noticed that Doc Porter is in attendance, and uh, we would just like to recognize the incredible amount of support that we've received from her project, Bibliophily, um, both in in guiding us in our metadata standards and in in talking with us about how to approach this amount of material. We're extremely grateful for the medieval community, which tends to be very generous. Um, it's a great. It's a great community to work in, um, but Bibliophilia has particularly been a wonderful friend to this project. So thank you, Dot. I, 
I'd like to know, and so, certainly when your project started you know, during the pandemic, you know, what were the greatest challenges? And if each of you, if you could address that, you know, kind of coming together, you know, physical materials that you have to, um, you know, I know you're still doing your site visits, but can you speak a little bit about the, these were your experiences? Yeah, site, site visits were a big challenge. We had initially anticipated to be able to finish them, uh, I think within roughly the first six months of the project. <laughs> and that did not happen because so many campuses had restrictions um, on who could visit and who could research on their campuses. And so, uh, as I mentioned, it was is so crucial to have that site visit before items got sent to IU for digitization because uh, we learned a lot from our partners while we were there, and we were able to um, provide, we were able to, to think through with the partners kind of which items needed to be digitized, right? if there were any conservation issues that needed to be addressed that we needed to go back to the IU Bloomington team and kind of give them a heads up about. Um, so, you know, just making sure that we had an accurate count of what we're, what we're going to include in the project and making sure everything was kind of prepared to travel to IU Bloomington and arrive safely. Um, that was all uh, very important in those site visits. And so having to push those back, um, it slowed us down at first, but I think it was, it was good. It gave us time to like work out a relationship with Ochre, which has been really exciting. And, um, and so I think we've benefited from having a little bit of extra planning time on the front end of the project. Yeah, certainly a challenge to begin a project that involves um, a bit of travel uh, during during um, uh, spring and and summer of of um, twenty twenty. Um, the the first bit of travel was going to be a uh, in person in person meeting of all project partners uh, in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, and and we. We we had a number of conversations about what to do with that, whether to put it off until travel was possible again. Uh, we do hope to hope to be able to to come together at the end of the of the project, but uh, made the decision to go ahead and with a, um, a set of online workshops over the spread over over I think two uh, four sessions over two weeks, if I recall correctly. That that I thought was was really showed how this project how it was how this project could work despite despite the challenges it was facing it was a good um, a good demonstration of, of the the team that that we have here and our strengths um, I see a question in the chat um, from Thomas Bonnell thank you very much for a question asking what our success rate was in reaching out to various colleges about participating, um, which is an excellent question. Uh, we did essentially the same thing that Lisa Fagan Davis and Melissa Conway did when they started their update um, to the update to the Derici census, which was uh, con cold contacting institutions to ask about their collections. Um, that was some work that Sarah started and uh, we identified a lot more collections than are in the list of participating partners. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the particular challenges is uh, for smaller institutions to, to dedicate resources, even uh, resources of uh, identifying possible materials for inclusion and the sort of administrative work that is involved in being part of the project. Um, so I think, uh, Gosh, Sarah, maybe you have a better idea of a number of additional partners. But I should also say we've we've reported all of the holdings that we discovered to Lisa Fagan Davis and Melissa Conway for their next version of the census. Um, but there's so much more material out there, even than uh, we're able to. I think it's amazing the number of things that we found in these 22 institutions. There's so much more still out there to discover. Yeah, we we cold emailed every institution in the Midwest, <laughs> broadly defined. Um, many of them did not respond because why would they? We were just like, we didn't even have funding yet. you know. So it's like the, the subset of institutions that are a part of our project are those that had faith that we could get funding. 
and, and move forward with it. And so, you know, we're, we're grateful for them for um, their excitement and participating uh, along with us in this journey. Um, in terms of, I, I know we have, I think at least 60 other institutions that we know have manuscript material that are not partners in addition to those that didn't respond to the first round, which, you know, I hear rumors of which is one of the fun things about this project. You'll hear these rumors like, oh my gosh, there are manuscripts at the Missouri Botanical uh, uh, um, Gardens, right? You should find them. Or, oh, uh, Southeastern Missouri State, SEMO, they have manuscripts. You should contact this person. It's like, man, I emailed them and they didn't email us back. Um, and so any, any leads that you have on manuscripts in the Midwest, please do let us know. We're gathering together a list of, if we continue this project beyond the current funding round, of people that we know we want to reach out to and contact and um, try to bring into the fold as we proceed forward. And definitely one of our partners is some, is, uh, sorry, our contact at one of our partner institutions is someone that I came across in another context who happened to mention to me an email from Sarah said, what's this about? And I said, you should definitely write back. <laughs> and now they're one of our partner collections. Any more questions, or I'm sure they'll be open to answering them. We're very happy to answer questions. Uh, if they come to you later, we would love to hear from you by email. Um, and I hope you're able to see in the chat where you can find us on Twitter and our project website, where we post regularly updates about our progress and also blog posts that are contributed by our partners talking about uh, what they're learning about their collections, what they know about their collections, and their experience. Um, so I hope you have a chance to look at that as well. But thank you all very much for, for being with us tonight and for talking with us about our project. Thank you all. Thank you. Mary Ann? Oh, all I can I say like is, wow. You. <laughs> what a um, what a great presentation and what a fascinating project. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to hear more about it. Um, I know I certainly learned a lot. And while I don't like to speak for others, I will guess that everyone else did as well. So please join me in thanking Ian, Liz, and Sarah. It's kind of hard to give a rousing round of applause <laughs> virtually, but you know, this way or with the icon on the screen or whatever works. And thanks to everybody who joined this evening for uh, the program. Much appreciated. Um, I hope you all also enjoyed it. Um, please be safe. Stay warm, and I hope you all have a happy Thanksgiving. Good night. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you very much.